Great to be here. Uh, my name is Richard Latkani. I'm a director and cinematographer. I live in Vienna, in Austria. And uh, we did this film, we started um, three years ago, to work on Sea of Shadows. Um, I've known Andrea for quite a bit longer. Uh, we did another film together called The Ivory Game, which is on Netflix, about the extinction of elephants. And, uh, you know, we wanted to continue what we did back then with a new uh, mission. So this time, the journey took us to... Uh, to Mexico, where there's a big battle going on uh, between the drug cartels and I'll call it planet Earth, because they're attacking our planet by, uh, by killing off an ocean to extract something they call the cocaine of the sea, um, to make millions of dollars in China. And by doing so, they're killing the ocean. And that's what this film is about. Andrea, can you tell, tell us about your role in this? Yes, my name is Andrea Crosta. I'm the founder and executive director of uh, a Los Angeles-based organization called Earth League International. Um, we are specialized in um, uh, information gathering, investigation, undercover operations uh, on wildlife crime around the world. We work in uh, now Latin America, Asia, Africa on a variety of different uh, wildlife crime-related uh, issues. And uh, we work as a small... Uh, intelligence agency for the planet. A few years ago, I started to recruit a former FBI, former CIA, um, crime analyst, um, um, cyber, cyber specialist, and we um, attack the legal supply chain as you attack usually other global threats like terrorism or narco-trafficking by investigating the supply chain and go after the big uh, trafficker, the big kimpings, corrupt government officials. And that's what we do, basically, and that's what we did in Mexico and China. Great. And, and Jack? My name is Jack Hutton, and I'm a crew member on board a Sea Shepherd vessel in the Sea of Cortez fighting on the front lines. My role is I'm a drone pilot, and I'm the first officer on that ship. And I work for Sea Shepherd, an organization you know, traditionally known for its aggressive, nonviolent, direct action tactics most well known for like crashing into whaling ships and stuff like that. And on the ground there, we try remove as many of these deadly gill nets as possible from the ocean. So there's a, a lot to, complex, to, uh, to unpack here. It's a complex story and, and it's all put together uh, beautifully in the film. Uh, but we've got uh, Sea Shepherd and, we, and we've got the uh, Earth League and so on. Uh, but it seems it all starts uh, with the vaquita. Uh, so tell us about that. The vaquita is the smallest whale on earth, and the reason that people are talking about it is because it's, um, it's actually going extinct right now in front of our eyes. Um, so there is um, a big campaign to stop that, but this would be the first marine mammal to go extinct in like the last 50 years. Uh, and it's happening in front of our eyes, five hours drive south of Los Angeles. And this got our, or my attention as a filmmaker because I, I want to point my cameras and, and, and point a big spotlight on issues that are happening right now under our nose, but we are not even aware of it. And this topic did just not get enough attention. And it is a big deal to let a species go extinct. As we all know, extinction is forever. Um, but in this case, if the vaquita actually goes extinct, then it would mean also the end of the Sea of Cortez, which is uh, one of the most beautiful ecosystems in the world. It's an ocean that Jacques Cousteau, when he, when he was there doing his research, called um, the aquarium of the world. So it's incredibly diverse in, 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 in wildlife. You have whales and dolphins and sharks. You have white, great white sharks. You have the flying manta, like what are they called flying? Um, Bad eagle rays. Uh, eagle rays, rays, you know, by the thousands. Um, you have schools of dolphins by the thousands. So it's an incredibly rich place. But um, this place is under attack by cartels for money and greed. And no one knows about it. And this vaquita, there are now less than 15, one five vaquitas left on planet Earth. And they are still there. Um, we're fighting for them. They are fighting for them. Because if the vaquita goes, it will mean that the drug cartels are going to take over this entire area completely. It will mean that international attention will shift away from this place. 
because they will say, okay, we lost the war, let's move on to the next one, and the cartels is going to move in, and they're going to basically destroy and extinct, like, it will be extermination for all marine life there, because they are looking for this totoaba, and that totoaba fish, you know, it's a bit complicated to understand, but this totoaba fish has a swim bladder that in China um, can sell for up to $100,000 per swim bladder. So one fish is worth $100,000. Nobody knows exactly how many totoabas there are, surely more than 100,000 or so, but if they go for them, and if they want to catch every last one of them, they will kill everything that's there. Um, now the vaquita is such a, is like the, the role model of this whole story because it is incredibly beautiful. It's straight out of a Disney movie, I think, you know. It's the most elusive animal as well. It has never been filmed before. So it was the first time ever that we filmed it for the world to see. Um, and the reason it's never been filmed is because nobody ever got close to one. They're extremely shy. They live in the shadows. They don't like humans. But um, we were there with a huge mission of 90 scientists and 15 boats. And our mission was to, to find them and put them into a safe haven out of, out of, the, out of conflict just because they're, they're dying. Um, and that mission is, is partly shown in the film. So, so first, can, can you tell us a little bit about how you decided on the title? You know, the vaquita lives in the shadows. Most of the illegal business takes place in the shadows and at night. So during the day, the sea might seem calm and beautiful. You have the sunlight and everything's nice and it looks like a perfect vacation spot. But then come darkness, things turn around, the cartel moves in, the poachers arrive, and then it's like a war. So most of the, the illegal fishing goes on during the night. Um, at least that was the case when we were there. Now, um, you know, Jack just returned from the front line like yesterday. So he's, he just came from the ship in San Felipe. Now the war is even more open. It's, it's actually for the first time taking place during the day. The poachers have become less scared. Um, they, they really go out. They even attack their ships. Um, they have been attacked by 50 ships uh, at one time. They were, you know, throwing Molotov cocktails to like burn down their ship and attack them. And they, they boarded their ship even and destroyed all their gear and equipment. So it's a very dangerous kind of war. Uh, and it's now happening in broad daylight. But yeah, this is how we, we found the title. It just, just worked. And then of course the SOS, uh, it actually came after. Like we didn't, we weren't aware of it until someone uh, sent us an email in reference to SOS. And we're like, SOS, yes, of course, you know? So, um, yeah, that's how, that's how it came to be. Yeah. Okay. And, and tell us about the, this whole uh, flow of uh, money and, and fish parts and so on. I think uh, Andrea is the expert on the yeah. trafficking side. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, so what happened, it's, it's actually this situation is very, very similar to a um, situation that we are now researching and monitoring around the world. We're, talk, we're working on rhino horn trafficking, ivory trafficking, even jaguar trafficking from Latin America. And every time there is, uh, uh, um, we try to work in terms of international supply chain. So it's, you know, you start from the, from the beginning for ground zero and then you go up the chain in order to find who are the real drivers, who are the real enablers. In this case, in Mexico, what happened is that uh, uh, the Chinese uh, traders in Mexico, uh, they're all businessmen, so they're all into other legit businesses like supermarkets, hotels and stuff, but they're also making a lot of money by trafficking uh, illegal stuff, including Totoaba. They team up with the uh, current and former narco traffickers and the owners of the fishing cooperatives. They created what we call the Totoaba cartels, and they have been uh, uh, smuggling an incredible amount, in, uh, enormous quantities of Totoaba in the past uh, mostly five, six years. We're talking about millions and millions of dollars uh, in Mexico. Uh, the fisherman or the fishing cooperative gets four or five thousand dollars per swim bladder, uh, and then the more you go up the chain, the more the price goes up. Uh, all the, and then the, on the black market in China, we're talking about a minimum of thirty, thirty-five, fifty, hundred thousand dollars per swim bladder. 
the Chinese believe that uh, um, this particular swim bladder from Totoaba is good for uh, uh, pregnant women and, and for your blood. So there is a whole market for that. Um, the, the, in our opinion, and that's the, basically the result of three years of investigation between Mexico and China, the key people along the supply chain are the Chinese traffickers in Mexicali and Tijuana and Mexico City. They, they are able to smuggle the, the stuff back to uh, China. They are, we discover that they're also into money laundering, uh, human smuggling, fake passports. So we share, as usual as we do, usually we share a lot of information, confidential intelligence with law enforcement agency around the world. In particular, we share with Mexican authorities, US authorities, and Chinese authorities. Um, the effort is to go after these specific individuals. We share with the uh, Mexican authorities a thick confidential report with a lot of uh, information on a lot of people all involved. And the idea is for them to go after you know, the right people and cut the head of the Hydra where it, where it, where it, where it makes sense. And now you say uh, sharing information, but, but that's not just uh, transmitting a document, right? So you're going undercover, yes. you're putting yourself in the line of, of danger. We have uh, uh, trained undercover uh, teams uh, specialized not only in pretending to be the bad guys, so not only to pretend, they pretend to be buyers and sellers and traders, a businessman in general, they also fully train in uh, um, recording uh, a conversation with hidden um, audio recording devices or video recording devices. Uh, very often the whole, in, in this case especially, the whole uh, conversation is mostly Chinese, sometimes a bit Sp Spanish, so there is a lot of work back home to download the whole thing, to do the transcript, translated the transcript from Chinese into English. Then at home we have uh, two, three crime analysts working on the transcript. We also have a team of, uh, we have two really, really young, sorry, bright, but young uh, cyber specialists. They are, they use a few software to go into the deep web and understanding, they, they are really good in, collect, in connecting uh, information coming from the field uh, with information out there. So they connect this name with that email, with that telephone number, with that organization. So all this information goes to uh, the confidential intelligence brief together with very detailed uh, crime charts. You have to imagine, you know, big crime charts with all the targets linked to each other uh, and there's whole explanation about each person. So when we give this to law enforcement, they can really jumpstart an investigation. They can start the day after, basically, uh, with a lot of information uh, you know, coming from us. Yeah. I would like to add that for me as a filmmaker, I always look for the unusual players, you know, like usually for example, in the previous film, The Ivory Game, when I went to um, Africa to find out, okay, who's fighting for the survival of the elephants and against ivory trafficking and all these things. So I look at the, there's a, you know, probably about 150 NGOs working there. Then there's always the big names that everybody hears, hears about. You know, you have the Greenpeace, the WF, and, you know, all these players. But then you have those smaller entities that are extremely exposed to danger, but really there at the front lines making a big difference, but nobody hears about them. And so th those are the people that I look for, the underdogs, but th that are extremely effective in solving the problem. So the two organizations sitting here, they represent them, you know, Jack, Sea Shepherd and Earth League International. They're unique in this place because Sea Shepherd is on the front line and they are fighting the poachers straight on. And they're putting their ships and their lives be between the animals and evil, so to say. But what they're really doing, the bigger picture is they're buying the ecosystem and these animals time. Time that will run out eventually because they have, yes, three ships there and crew and they're really very effective, but the poachers are stronger. They have more money to put in. As long as there is a big business behind it, they will always win the battle, in the, you know, eventually. So basically, you need organizations like Earth League International to use that time and to find the larger like, players that are actually enabling all this you know, war. And his people and his team, they found that this all, you know, on the front lines, it looks like it's Mexican cartel versus 
the NGOs and the government, but he actually found out that is the Chinese mafia in Tijuana that is paying off the cartel to fight the war for them on the front lines. So the money's coming from the Chinese traffickers and the Chinese mafia based in Tijuana. Now, this was crucial for us to find a solution to the problem because with that information that he shared with the government agencies, they could actually crack down where it really hits hard and where it really will disrupt the entire you know, trafficking chain and it will kill the market. And that's what you have to find. So their work is, is, is really unique and crucial. And I think, you know, in my opinion, they should get the spotlight and they should be out there and the world should know about them because they're extremely effective maybe, maybe they in solving the, the issue. Clip. You know, you did your research on the front lines of the, of the cartel that was in Santa Clara where it was really a no-go zone. Even for us, we could only stay like for maybe 48 hours until we had to leave. They really found, you know, where we stayed and everything. They sent even drones after us. So it was like a really tricky thing. But um, the journey at the end of the road, and you will see it in the film, leads to the Chinese mafia in Tijuana. Um, so that's, yeah, very special. Yeah. And, uh, and you certainly get the feeling that you two guys are, uh, are, are in organizations that are quite different than the norm, right? When I, when I think of an environmental group, I think of, oh, uh, let's plant a tree or <laughs> let's reduce our use of plastics. Uh, but, but you're quite different than that. You're going out there putting yourself in the way of danger and uh, uh, having a more immediate impact uh, sort of right away. Yeah, I think we need that today. You know, we need to be more active. We need to be in the faces of people. We need to be more aggressive as well because the cartels and the evil people and the politicians and, you know, the populists and what we have, they are using the media and the platform to play for, you know, to, 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 to brainwash so many people into thinking, oh, it doesn't matter or let's look the other way or whatever, like who cares? So you need to be more aggressive and out there. And Sea Shepherd, for example, is, you know, I wouldn't say you're aggressive, but you are, you do, do not run away from danger. And maybe you talk about it. I mean, you go into these things every day. Yeah, I mean, if, if we're looking at just ocean plastic for, or, or, or whales for one thing, like everyone, everyone has the, the save the whales mentality, right? That's, the, that's a general thing that we go after. Um, and it's like, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll not use a plastic straw today or a piece of single-use plastic. But then if we're just looking at abandoned fishing nets, 46% of ocean plastic is abandoned fishing nets. If we're looking at saving whales, like everyone knows and everyone openly condemns the Japanese harpooning a whale in the back of the head, that's a big problem. But the Japanese kill 1,600 whales a year. Norwe Norwegians kill something similar. Icelandic kill about 400. Every single day, 1,000 whales and dolphins are killed as bycatch. Every single day from fishing gear and from illegal fishing. 40% of all fishing in our oceans is illegal. And it's, it's not tackled because it's sort of swept out of sight, out of mind. No one, no one looks towards the ocean for illegal fishing. You know, we talk about ocean trash and stuff, which is a huge problem. But, or, or climate change, which is a huge problem, but climate change will not be the thing that kills the ocean. Overfishing will be. That'll happen far before. So we need to tackle these things head on. And we need to make people care about that subject. Well, how do you make people care about that subject? You, you have to get into the media. And one of the ways that everybody looks at something is violence and scandal. Like, that's sort of the reality of, of it. And that's what Sea Shepherd's tactics have always been, is get into the media and highlight a problem by putting ourselves in between an evil and damaging act of destroying our planet and just putting ourselves in the way of that. We know what the problem is in San Felipe. Those fishing nets are killing thousands of animals. Me and my crew have had to crawl through 4,000 dead animals caught in those fishing nets. We've taken 900 out of the ocean there. That's 170 nine, nine kilometers. Nets. 900 nets. nets. 900 nets. Yeah. That's 170 kilometers of nets, just in that little tiny area. We're not even talking about a big area. We're talking about like 20 miles by 20 miles. So we know what the problem is, and our goal is just to put ourselves in it and highlight that problem as much as we can. And if we hadn't been doing that for the last five years, the vaquito would be gone. But yeah, we are buying time. We're buying time for Andrea. We're buying time for that. 
But if we hadn't done it for five years, be nothing to buy time for. We have a very big uh, impact campaign as well for the film because we, we started to make this film not just to make a film and that film then will be on TV or something and, and in the theaters. We made this film to actually change government policy in Mexico. So just like our previous film, The Ivory Game, which was um, very successful because the one thing that, um, I mean, you said it's so great, the only thing that can save the elephant right now is for the Chinese president to ban the trade of ivory, the legal trade of ivory in China. Um, here is one man, I remember you saying, one man who can save, I don't, what, what was your line? One the, man no, can the, save. No, the fate of destiny is in the hands of only one man, the president of China. The president of and China. still is, actually. Two months after the film came out, the Chinese government banned the ivory trade. And the same day that they announced that you know, new law, they invited us to fly into the Beijing Film Festival and open the festival and present the film in China because they thought it was very important that the Chinese people see that elephants are being slaughtered for ivory. Many Chinese thought that they just fall off like antlers fall off. And they were not aware of this dark war going on. So this really moved us in a very big way that a movie can have such a huge impact even for a government in China. Um, and and I can still go to China. And you can still go to China. <laughs> you, you know, we, we thought actually that was a you know, decoy. They just wanted to arrest us. Like, it was like we couldn't believe we were VIPs, you know, suddenly. Yeah. So, and in this case, the Chinese government acted six months after Andrea gave them the entire intelligence report on the Chinese community that is involved in the trafficking of Totoaba. Um, 32 traffickers were arrested in China with Totoaba worth $150 million. So this was huge. I mean, huge success for your organization and only, yeah. huge success, of course, for also what impact a film can have. Um, so, you know, for us, it's important to, to put the message out and to encourage people to actually, you know, go out and do something. And films can make such a big difference because they emotionally connect you to a topic, to an issue that you didn't even know about before, that you never cared about. But suddenly here you are emotionally caught because you have met a Vaquita and you have, you know, seen these heroes you know, risk their lives for the planet and you get inspired and you want to do more. So a lot is happening right now, even in Mexico. The government has invited us to show the film in the Mexican Senate. They have become very active. The president is talking about it. And they just announced two weeks ago that they are going to send in 600 additional troops into the area to protect the vaquita from extinction. At the same time, they asked us for more screenings in the area to educate the people. So film has become a very, very powerful tool. And that's why we go out and, and risk so much and make these films and then present them even here. So the what moment. else can you tell us about uh, what's happened in Mexico uh, since the film? Uh, so, you, so you mentioned some of that. Uh, where is Oscar Pera, the, the main bad guy from the film now? And uh, where Well, I don't want to give away too much because people will still see the film. Yeah. But um, one of the big bad guys, um, yes, he was put away. He was the big drug cartel boss. Uh, he was arrested. Um, and he's still in a high security prison. So he's awaiting trial though, so that takes years. Um, and, but still the war is on and the cartels are moving into position. Um, this is gonna be the final battle this season. It starts in November, so very soon. And then the, that's, it's called the Totoaba run. They come in from November for spawning and then leave by June. And in this time when they circle into the area, that's when the killing takes place. That's when they put out the nets, you know, thousands of nets go in and they kill whatever they can because that's like the gold rush, you know. It comes in six months of slaughter and in that six months, that's most likely if things happen and continue as they were, we're gonna lose the vaquita. So it's not, you know, unless the government is effective, unless your investigation, they are starting a second run um, called Fake Gold 2 which is sending in more undercover investigators, you know, Chinese and, and, and others to kind of monitor the situation on the ground. Um, sea Shepherd is there with three ships ready for battle, you know, with water cannons and all kinds of things. Um, 
the government is sending in troops, so it's going to be a war. Um, and you can see how this war looks and what the stakes are in Sea of Shadows. So when you see the movie, you will get it. And then it's still ongoing. All right, so, so we, uh, I saw the movie, it's inspiring. If, if the average citizen sees that and gets inspired, what can we do, right? I, I, I can't go out and, no. uh, and, and well, be on the front Well, number one, lines. I think, is to, to, to support the very unique organizations that are making the difference, which is these two, Earth League International and Sea Shepherd. They, the, this combination right here is probably the most useful, you know, combination and an attack against evil that you can find. Um, they are the only two organizations in the field risking everything to stop it. They are NGOs. They are both, you know, they do not take government funds to stay independent. They, you know, depend on donations that can go uh, via their websites. Um, Earth League International and Sea Shepherd, you find them and you can donate to their missions. And uh, I think that is the most useful thing. If you go to our website, seaofshadows.film, you will find um, background information on the organizations. We also have a petition to sign. We're close to 100,000 signatures now. That petition is an action plan to the government on what needs to happen to stop the problem. Every signature immediately generates an email to the current Minister of Environment. So his inbox is pretty full already, and let's get it even higher to a million. Uh, so they understand that the world cares. And, you know, just start talking about this issue. Like, we need this issue out there. We need for people to know that this is a war and it's being fought right now. People are dying because of it. And it's a war against our planet by forces of evil. And it's so close to, to the United States from Mexico, from Calexico. It's a two hour drive. It's very close and it's a beautiful place. And we're losing it right now because of inaction and people not caring. And, you know, we are trying to get people to care. And I believe that everything is connected, you know, like what, 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 what you say is, is so true. Nature, everything matters and there is a big balance going on. The, all the species in there, us humans, the environment, it's all connected. So if the vaquita goes and if other animals go, it has a ripple effect throughout the world, you know. And it also shows that we are incapable of making a difference, of actually going in and saving something, even though we see it happen, we know it's happened, it's like a ticking time bomb. And I just can't believe, like, if we lose this war, in this tiny small area, 20 by 20 square miles, I mean, kilo, uh, miles, then what can we save? Uh, How can we save other, other species? I, I always, I mean, I will always talk in terms, in very concrete terms. Uh, and on the top of that, I want to add that in this case, like in many other cases around the world, this kind of trafficking, this kind of businesses provide a lot of money for da very dangerous people. So it's not just about nature, it's not ju just about animals and species. Of course, it's very important. It's why I wake, the reason I wake up every morning, but it's not that simple. Uh, these are millions and millions of dollars getting into the coffins of very dangerous people. Uh, uh, in, in, in Africa, the same kind of business is connected to militia and terrorist group. Uh, we know of traffickers in, South, in Southeast Asia trafficking everything, including Totoaba, rhino, pangolin, tigers. They are in bed with terrorists and, and big narco traffickers. And the easiest way to make money right now on the planet is, in, is environmental crime. The profits are incredible. The risks are none. And this is the perfect way to make a lot of millions very quickly and then reinvest them immediately in, in other kind of trafficking. So just don't, don't think about it. It's just about nature. It's, it's much more than that. It's about everything, including us. Now, now Jack, you had that philosophical statement about the uh, greed of a few trying to, to bring in those millions. Uh, but there's also the many in the, in the form of the, the fishermen in the area who traditionally you know, decades ago, were making their living off the sea, and now things have changed. Uh, so wh where do you see their lives going forward, and how can they uh, continue to provide for themselves and their family without disrupting the, the sea? Well, we're, we're asking for a very minimal area. Like, this area is not the entire northern gulf there. 
and we understand the need for you know small in scale um, fishing, whatever. It's it's large scale industrial fishing that is what is killing the ocean, and that's what ninety six percent of all fishing is. That that small you know artisanal fishing is never what we we fight against. And in a t that twenty by twenty mile zone does not take away the entire fishing area. It provides a refuge for the rest of the animals to breed and increase in numbers. So actually, you probably increase fishing profits if they just kept out of that area and kept it clean. In the future, as well, they used to get a compensation payment. A compensation payment to stay off the water so that this area could be sorted out. That compensation payment has stopped. So there's no compensation payment. The fisheries are about to reopen. So not only will we see Totoaba fishing next year, but we're also going to see shrimp and chano fishing. Now, we're going there with a zero tolerance policy for everything within that zone. We're just going to say, no, nothing in this zone. And we're going to try to protect it as best we can. And I would hope that we, we're able to do that for another year. But certainly, if, if nothing changes, like we're preparing for battle right now, because this is sort of our last chance to save this vaquita. And a lot needs to happen. A lot more needs to happen. But the future is possible. Mexico is the eighth biggest economy in the world. Like, there's money there. You can, you can have that compensation payment. It's not impossible. We're talking about 30,000 people with uh, 2,000 fishermen. With the eighth biggest economy in the world, you can't have a compensation payment or provide for these people. I don't buy that. The problem is also that the fishermen um, have you know, have been really badly influenced by the money and the, and the, and the lure of, of the cartel. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is a huge problem. They're dangling thousands and thousands of dollars in front of their heads saying, come work for us and you'll be rich. And they go for the quick, you know, for the quick money, not understanding that the consequences are going to be devastating to their future. Because by killing off the ocean, and killing everything in it just to get those totoabas, they are destroying their fishing grounds. And also what's gonna happen is there's gonna be a huge embargo by the United Nations against Mexico if the vaquita goes extinct. And even before that, if, they, if the Mexican government is not able to show that they are adequately protecting the vaquita from harm from the cartels, they are threatening a very big embargo. We were very lucky because the UN very early on uh, screened our film in New York at headquarters and then again two times in Geneva and then one more time in Vienna. And at the Geneva CITES con convention, which is the biggest um, wildlife trade convention in the world where they decide on laws and import and export laws of wildlife, they announced a full embargo against Mexico um, a week after we screened the movie there. Um, if the vaquita goes extinct, you will be punished severely, and there will be a complete ban of any exports uh, out of Mexico that includes shrimp, which is their biggest number one export. So this really scared the Mexican government, and I'm sure this has a lot to do with the 600 troops they're sending in. So again, our film is having the impact it should have. The government is understanding that there will be consequences and, you know, and they need to take action. And we brought one more clip that just shows you how crazy the fishermen can get if some of them, some of their own get arrested. Um, they arrested three fishermen and illegal fishermen, li illegal fishermen uh, out there going for Totoaba and then a whole mob showed up to free them from a Navy base where they were being held. What happens when the law just breaks down, you know, and when cartels run the show and when fishermen are convinced that they are more powerful than the government, which they are currently because the cartel backs them. So anything they do, will, there will not be serious consequences. So, you know, this is what we're battling against, uh, you know, a, a kind of a, a revolution in, in, against government and against nature that is taking place right now, but a bad revolution, not a good one, you know. Can you explain uh, what the fishermen were doing that was Ill illegal in that case? They were fishing Totoaba and uh, they had um, the nets on board and they had the Totoaba scales were still there. So they were caught kind of uh, red handed, I think you say, when uh, in the middle of, you know, the act and they were arrested. At least it, w it was an attempted arrest because, you know, yes, they were arrested. But then the 
they were freed because they stormed the base and the Navy didn't want to escalate further. They were trying to avoid deaths and so forth. So they just gave them back and basically gave up to the cartel, like just said, okay, you win. Um, and that is a really, really bad message and signal to any legal fishermen who are still trying to abide by the law and try to do the right thing. If they see that the bad guys win and have the upper hand, you know, this place is, is going to hell. So that's why it needs this attention. And that's why also, for example, what's super helpful is that our, we have an executive producer um, who's big celebrity, Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, and he's helping us push out this message and, and let the world know that the vaquita exists and that this problem is going on. So that is another part of our package of trying to have a global push in this issue and to make people aware. You need someone like him to really raise awareness and, and get the message out. So it's all part of the package. We have a great production company, Teramata, uh, who's, who's like, you know, putting the funds up and is, is helping to, to make a production like this possible. They have global reach as well. And then we have National Geographic. They're taking this film to 170 countries. It will air on November 9th, by the way, in the United States. And then throughout the fall, across the world, Asia, everywhere, it's going to be in like, you know, many, many different languages. So we are pushing as hard as we can to make people aware this is going on and they, yes, they should care, even though it's an animal they have never heard about. It's a symbol of what's going on with our planet, that our planet is under attack and we're losing right now. And we have to stop this and, and, and let people know there's a red line they can't cross. So another thing you cover in the film is the efforts of the scientists to uh, protect the, the vaquita from a different organization, not, not either of yours two. Uh, vaquita and, CPR. Vaquita mm -hmm. CPR, and, uh, and they have some setbacks. Can, can you tell us about uh, their efforts? Right. Vaquita CPR was how the whole thing actually began. Um, we, vaquita CPR is a big rescue mission that was started in October uh, 2017 to uh, catch the remaining vaquitas that are out there. Back then, they were still 30. Now we're below 15. To catch all of them and put them into a safe haven, like a refuge, um, protected from cartel and protected from this madness until they can resolve the conflict at sea. Um, the thinking was, if we do not extract the vaquita from conflict, they will die and it, it will be all over. So we, we have to take action and remove them from the wild. Now, this big operation um, was also supported by Leonardo DiCaprio, and that's how it all began. He actually called us and said, could you do a movie about this issue? There's a huge rescue operation starting. I'm supporting it. I've met with the Mexican president. I can open doors for you, give you an exclusive um, window to film this. No other film teams allowed. And then you can maybe turn it into a movie that I'll help you push out. And, uh, and then we can raise awareness on the vaquita. So this is how it all began. And that rescue mission happened. There was 15 ships involved. Um, there were 90 scientists, the best of the best in the world, were drawn from all over, from New Zealand, Japan. You know, they came from everywhere to do their best and find those vaquitas and save them. But in the end, um, I don't want to give away too much, but the whole mission unfortunately failed. Um, and it was a huge setback for everyone. And as soon as all the foreigners moved out, um, the cartel moved in. And it became very dark, very quickly, and very dangerous. And we had to hire security. We had to hire bodyguards to keep us safe. And everything suddenly turned 180 degrees, and, and the war began. So it was like, yeah, we were caught in a storm and, that and we didn't expect. And when was this? When did this change happen? This was happen? all in. Um, five weeks after the operation yeah. started and then failed. So it was in November 4th was when the mission was called off and the cartel moved in like within weeks. And yeah. November 4th of last year? Of 2017. 2017. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, don't think that this is over. Don't think that this is like something that happened two years ago. This is happening right now. The war is more extreme than ever. In fact, the war that's coming up with 600 additional troops from the Navy is going to escalate to proportions that we have never seen before. So, yeah. yeah. So there's a scene where one, one of the scientists is saying, oh, uh, look how smart these vaquita are. They're evading the nets and, and so on. Uh, 
how much do we know about them? And, and are they smarter than other machine, uh, marine mammals, or do we just not know hardly anything about them? We, we don't know much. In fact, currently we have a, one of our ships is equipped with um, a lot of scientists that are on board. Um, and we have big binoculars, and we're doing currently a Vaquita observation period because poaching hasn't happened to track, tra try track down exactly where the few remaining individuals hang out so that we can organize our tactics to best protect them. But we really know very, very little about these animals. Up until the film, they had never been filmed before. We actually got some amazing photographs a couple weeks ago, so we've, we've just seen them. They're still there. Yeah. Um, and currently, I do believe today, might have actually just died. Yeah, we have a ship currently looking for them right now. So, um, but there's just not that much data on them. What we do know is the last big, big survey of them was done in 1997, which is very interesting because I was born in 1997. <laughs> um, and there was about 600, and now there's fewer than 15. So, I mean, we, we have some data on this animal, but really not a lot. And if we don't leave them alone, if we don't remove this threat, then we're not going to have a lot of data on them. What we do know is that there is enough genetic diversity for that species to recover because the population had never been very big in the first place. Mm -hmm. So this population through the millions of years of evolution has really sticked to this very small environment and never been a very large population. So the genetic strength is within the animals to recover from such low numbers. And there's actually examples of this happening in the wild of populations recovering to over 100,000 individuals from 10. So with the few remaining vaquitas, there is still the potential for this species to come back. There is still hope. They just need to be left alone. And that's what we want. That's what we're trying to do. The, the counting of the vaquitas that is happening right now is also very important. And it's, again, organized by Vaquita CPR. And they are working with the Mexican government and Sea Shepherd and Museo de la Ballena to, to make sure that there's still enough out there to make it worth the fight, and that's crucial. But you know, fortunately, six have been seen in early September, and as you just said, they can come back. With there two, was two youngs. With yeah, there were two young ones, so they are still reproducing, and they actually certainly can come back if they are just left alone. Um, they took DNA samples during the first mission where they caught two vaquitas and analyzed them, and they you know in in the labs of Noah in San Diego, and they they found that the DNA says, yes, even if there's four or five or six only left, they can repopulate to a large number uh, if they're just left alone, which is great news. So certainly seeing the movie, you, you empathize with them as a critically endangered species. Uh, I also worried for you guys that uh, you might be critically endangered <laughs> <laughs> with, with everything that you went through. Uh, what was that like? It'll be a Jack CPR one day. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, look, for, 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 for me, I was just hiding behind these guys. Yeah. So it's basically like, you know, I we was more worried about the two of them because you. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't in front of the camera. Well, yeah, I, was, I just held it on them and said, go there into danger. No. <laughs> yeah. But for me personally, that ship sailed already since the Ivory game. So I, I know that my face is known. So I am in the field only when it, when it makes sense. My job is now to put together incredible teams and supervise their work. Uh, personally, I, I always like to be at least a few times in the field with them, just to, because it's the only way to understand their challenges and how they work, and otherwise it's impossible to. Uh, whenever we partner with the big media production like this one, uh, like we did in Mexico, we always split basically the team in two. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, three, including myself, decided to be on camera. Um, and other four or five, they were ghosts throughout the film. They were, they were, yeah. they were searching. Um, actually, the funny thing is that during the fi this film, I, um, as you can imagine, when you have uh, a crew of five, six people around you, the classic fly on the wall doesn't work anymore. I mean, you can't. You're an elephant. Uh, so I invented for myself... Uh, a fake identity. I, I'm Italian, so I pretended to be an Italian journalist from Italy writing for a magazine about fishing. I also had the, the magazine about fishing, so and that worked perfectly. Uh, and that, that because then I, I had to just, you know, I had to go around with the camera and every, everyone wanted to talk to me. It became very, very easy to, 
to speak with people. And in the meantime, I was covering my other guys, the ghost, uh, working for, uh, you know, nobody you know. There are, even within our organization, Earth League International, very few know the identities of these people because I'm personally, I, in my previous life, I, I come from the high tech. I, you know, I, I established one of the very, very first uh, e-commerce companies in Italy back in 98, is the prehistory of e-shopping. And then high tech investigation intelligence, so that was my previous life. So I'm obsessed with uh, security and, and, and keep, you know, need to know basis. And this is how we protect ourselves. We cannot do miracles, but we, we do think about it. Now you guys are, are concentrating on uh, taking down these cartels. Uh, you're supported by uh, DiCaprio, and he's also done work uh, along with Yao Ming and others of uh, increasing awareness and reducing the demand uh, back in China and, and other places. Uh, do you see those approaches as complementary? They are complementary, but they are absolutely long term. Okay. What, what we need, in my humble opinion, what we need in China is a complete generational change. Uh, un, until you get, don't get there, that, you know, the young generation is different. We actually work with them. The current generation is, uh, you know, it's very resistant to, you know, to awareness campaigns. They still want to buy Rhino Ivory and, and so on. And many, many of the emergencies that my organization and Sea Shepherd is working together, we don't have that time. You know, we, when we are talking about the Vakita, we're talking about months. When we talk about rhinos or tigers or elephants, we're talking about a few years. So we, it's, it's group, of course, I, I'm, I'm in favor of awareness campaigns, but a long term. So we need something way more concrete to act in the next five, 10 years. But I think it, it all is a package. Yeah. You know, everyone benefits from all these different approaches happening at the same time. Like we raise immediate awareness for a problem that's happening right now but others may use that awareness to say, oh, what is the bigger, longer term picture? And we're going to focus on that. So what's important is that everyone tries to do their part to make a difference. And, you know, if big organizations want to run a big media campaign in China to like educate people about wildlife trade and, and that is harming our planet and that we should stop demanding those, those products that are killing nature, um, that's a really good thing and it, it really has to happen but you know it needs the multi-level approach they're on the front lines fighting the immediate killing they're you know understanding the supply chains and who are the real enablers and trying to expose them so they're taken down and others run the big campaigns to say to the public hey you shouldn't buy that you know this is really really bad and if all of them are a little bit successful then we have a chance we're all talking about climate change a lot of species, ecosystems, you know, marine areas will never see the effects of climate change. They will be gone by, now, by then. Mm -hmm. And that's, in my opinion, we, every time we talk about climate change, I will, every, every time we discuss about climate change, I still see missing this narrative. I still see missing the fight for biodiversity that literally has five, 10 years of life. We, if we don't act now, then, then they're gone forever. Okay. Uh, so thanks for all that. Uh, watch the film. Donate to the organizations. Uh, any last words before we wrap up? I think um, every one of us who, who sees the film should think about how they can make a difference. That's the most important part. We, we have chosen our paths. I'm a filmmaker, so I chose a path of making films to shine a spotlight that then can trigger different results. But everybody who may see the film or listen to our little talk here, they should start thinking, well, what can I do? Because every little step counts, and that, in the end, will help us live on a better planet for our you know, kids you know, to, to take advantage of and, and to enjoy. It's if we all start to think, okay, how can I help? Donating is surely a great thing because actually I 100% know that every dollar goes towards the greatest, you know, mission right now uh, to save the vaquita and so forth. But there may be other ways, you know, and all these problems about plastic and the use of, you know, you know, I mean, just at our hotel, everything is wrapped in plastic. Why? You know, how is it possible like that still these things happen? There are so many steps you can take depending on who you are. And I hope people are inspired to just go out there and make a difference today. 
All right. Thank you, Jack and Drea. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you, much. Richard. Thank you.